and amen. We're continuing uh, the series in the book of Acts, so would you please open your Bible in the book of Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And uh, the title of the series is The Acts of Jesus. I just want to remind you that every week because if we, uh, if we call it the Acts of the Apostles, it's almost like, oh, good for them. But if we see that it's really the acts of Jesus, meaning it's what Jesus continues to do now through us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we see that we are in the story. Because Jesus didn't stop saving, right? Jesus didn't stop loving. Jesus didn't stop uh, healing people. Jesus didn't stop doing all these things. But now he's doing through us, uh, through his sons, and through his daughters. And so uh, Acts has 28 chapters, and we are writing the 29th chapter with our very own lives. The story continues, and it continues through everyone that has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now, uh, as, we, as we see the, the, the whole situation where Peter and John, they're still in that situation, that they're preaching about Jesus, he resurrected, you know, and, and they're praying for people to be healed. And what happens is there's pushback and there's persecution. Uh, two weeks ago, we read that they went to jail only because they were preaching about Jesus and because they were uh, praying and some people got healed, if you remember that. And this week, they're going to go to jail again. And uh, at the end of the chapter, they're not only... Uh, going to jail but they're also going to be flogged and that means that they received 39 lashes just like Jesus received and so uh, just to tell you just to give you a little bit of a background of what's happening here before we start reading and so let's pick up in verse 12 of chapter 5 and it says the following the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade no one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Now, I just want to point out a couple of things here uh, in this first uh, passage that we read. They said that they, used, they were bringing people uh, near the streets so, so that at least Peter's shadow would be cast on them in the hopes that they will be healed by Peter's shadow. But the Bible does not say that anyone was healed because of Peter's shadow. I just want to say this because there's a tradition in the church and many Christians say that. Oh, Peter's shadow healed people. No, it, it, the Bible doesn't say it. It just says that they were hoping. Let's, let's put at least close to Peter. Let's see what happens. But the Bible doesn't record anyone being healed there. And, uh, and it says that they were bringing the sick and the tormented by impure spirits and all of them were healed. All of them. See, uh, I keep repeating this every week that there's some things in the book of Acts that, that it, the principles are for us, but not necessarily exactly what happened to them needs to happen to us. Meaning, it's not everybody that you and I are going to pray for that they're going to be healed. That's just the reality. But in their reality, because God was validating this new move of God, everyone that they were praying for were healed. We got to see the principle, how, what's the principle that we should extract uh, from this passage is that God can heal whoever he wants. We now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have authority over sickness and impure spirits. Yes, we do, because we don't pray in our name. We pray in Jesus' name. But sometimes we're going to pray believing that people will be healed, and sometimes they will, and sometimes we're going to pray for people to be healed, and they're not going to. If you guys remember, uh, uh, I'll say a decade ago, there was a radio show, 
and it was Pastor Chuck Smith. If you guys remember Pastor Chuck, he was on the radio from Santa Ana, and you could call and talk to Pastor Chuck, and one of our daughters, uh, she called. She's like, let's go, Pastor Chuck. I think she wanted to find out if there were pets in heaven, and she was five. And so we called, and we talked to Pastor Chuck. This guy's a celebrity. God used him to start the Jesus movement, and we talked to him on the phone while we heard ourselves on the radio. That was really cool. But what, what I remember from that day was that Pastor Chuck, right after my daughter uh, spoke to him, uh, that the following uh, person that called, he asked the same exact question. Pastor Chuck, why do we pray for people and sometimes they, they're not healed? And then, and then he asked, Pastor Chuck, when you pray for people, is everyone healed when you pray for people? And if you know Pastor Chuck's voice, and I'm going to make a very bad impression of Pastor Chuck, he will go, sometimes I pray for people and they're healed. And sometimes I pray for them, and they die. We just don't know. We're just going to go and pray, believing that the same Holy Spirit that, that rose Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that is in us. But now we have to surrender the results up to God. Are you following me, church? And so now we see that they, they were healed, and let's continue on reading. And it says, uh, then... The high priest, I skipped to, uh, now I'm verse 17. The high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. These guys are healing people and talking about Jesus. They're getting all the attention now. We want the attention. They were filled with jealousy. Remember this, jealousy. Repeat after me, jealousy. Okay, we'll talk about that. It's just for you to remember. And they arrested the apostles and put him in public jail but during the night an angel of the lord opened the doors of the jail and brought him out and here's the angel he, the angel he says go stand in the temple courts he said and tell the people all about this new life now we have to talk about what's happening here what's what's happening here they are arrested for the second time church Second time they, they get arrested. At the end, you can read in verse 39. I'm not going to get there. It's a long chapter. They are flogged. When it's time to release them back to the public, they are flogged. 39 lashes. And so what I'm telling you here, let's, let's, let's pay attention to what's happening here. They are preaching the word of Jesus to people. There's severe pushback that's coming against them. They're put to jail second time, and they're at the end of the chapter, they are flogged. And in chapter 7, we're going to see Stephen, one of the disciples, is killed because of the pushback that they were receiving because they were only preaching about Jesus. Now, the good news for us is that if we get out of the church today and we start inviting people to church and we start asking people, how can I pray for you? We can take it to the bank that we're not going to go to jail for that. Isn't that a moment that we can say, amen? Thank you, Jesus. Okay, we're not going to be flogged for that, but let me tell you one thing that's going to happen for sure. There is going to be pushback because in the same way that as we get out there trying to share the word of God that can bring salvation there is an enemy that's going to try to stop us and discourage us but here's the promise in the same way that the angel opened the doors of the, the jail cell kind of giving the stamp of approval from God go back doing what you're doing when we get out there the guarantee is there's going to be pushback but God is going to be with us giving us his seal of approval are you seeing this and so uh, you're like oh good good great but hey this is going to become more real for us at, at OB1 and what do you mean pastor uh, let's be honest I'm including myself here and uh, and and we're all together in this I'm no better than you guys uh, we most of us Christians we pray that God will bring people to church right God would you send someone would you send someone would you bring my mom and dad to church God God would you uh, use Google I pray that people Google it Christian churches in Ocean Beach would you use Google but the promise, but the call of God is go, go, go. All authority is given to me. Now I give it to you. Go. 
and make disciples of all nations. Now, the call of God is not for us to wait passively. It's for us to go and invite people to church. Now, how is this going to become practical? And I hope you get terrified because I am terrified. And let's be terrified together, okay? We're printing out some invite cards. And here it is right now. It's on the, it should be ready this week. This is the front and this is the back. It's a three-by-three three card. It says, welcome to the family in one side. And in the other side, the church's address and service times. We're printing, I don't know how many of these. What we're going to start doing and we really are doing, and that's when we're going to be terrified. Are you ready for this? We're going to get those cards and we're going to start walking around one, one month in Ocean Beach, second month in Point Loma, third month we're going to go to La Mesa, fourth month El Cajon, I don't know, downtown, the mall. We're going to start doing this and we're all going to be terrified together. And we're just going to keep break up in groups of two or three and be terrified in the name of Jesus. And all we're going to, right? Yes. Oh, it's... You know, it's being terrified alone is one thing. Being terrified with two other people, it's, it's a little different, right? It's just like going to the gym. It's hard to go alone. But if you have two other people going like, ah, I don't want to go too, but let's do it, right? We have to do it. Okay, let's do it. And so, but I believe that after we do this for two, three years, that will become the new norm for Ocean Beach First Baptist Church. That the new norm will be, we are people, that we get out there and we're simply going to do this, okay? Hey, we're inviting people to church. Would you like to come? We're inviting people to church. Would you like to come? Hey, is there anything that you would like me to pray for you? As, I'm, as we're just inviting people to church, we're going to say, is there anything I need to pray for you? The guarantee in the Bible is the following. There will be pushed back. Some people will call us idiots. Some people will say that we've been brainwashed. Some people will, whatever they're going to say, but we are going to continue on doing because that's the mission that Jesus gave us. The mission is you go, you go. Don't worry about salvation. I am, Jesus is saying, I'm the one who saves. You go, you invite, and you pray. Leave salvation up to me. You're going to find some people that I've been talking to already. And as they say yes to the message of Jesus Christ, check this out, church. That whole family lineage is going to change because of Jesus you got to think, about, we, the Christians, we have the greatest gift anyone can give in this entire world. It's a gift that has no end. It is a gift that can change a family line. It's not only going to change you, it's going to change your kids and your grandkids. It's going to break curses. It's going to break things that are maybe going in your family. Jesus can break those as you, as you break those by placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now everyone that follows is going to come to be blessed. And so we're going to get out there and let's be terrified together. And if you're thinking about, I'm never going to go, I'm praying for you. <laughs> I'm praying for you. What am I praying for? I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will remind you every day of the week as, as we're getting ready to do this. The, don't discard it. Just pray for it. God, give me boldness. Give me courage. Can you imagine, church? Can you imagine this? We break in um, 10 groups of three, let's say. And then first month we go like, hey, you guys go to the pier, you guys go to uh, whatever, the beach, and you guys go to uh, Dog Beach, and you guys go to Target, and you guys go to Sunset Cliffs, and there's 10 groups of three. Check this out. And each, one, each group speaks with 50 people. All we're doing is, hey, we'd like to invite you to church. Why? Because God is the best thing that ever happened in my life, and I want this to happen to you too, but he's not going to force you. You have to accept it or d d deny it. It's, 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 it's on you. Can you imagine if each group invites 50 people in one day, we can invite 500 people to receive salvation. It's like we're offering. We can't force people to receive it just in the same way that nobody forced you, and we can't force our kids to place our faith. We just guide them and direct them but there's one moment that each person has to make their decision who am I going to follow 
And so think about this. It's going to be, I think it's going to be revolutionary. I think it's going to be the new norm of Obi-Wan. We are people known, known that we get out there and we just invite people and invite people and invite people. And the ones that come and are saved, we disciple, we disciple, we serve, we make coffee, we do security, guest services, we do kids ministry, we do youth ministries because we're called to go and we're called to disciple. So let's be terrified together and let's start praying about this together and so but the blessing is the angel of the Lord opened the doors meaning God was with them and God's gonna be with us as we're doing his work amen church now the second thing we see here we skip to verse 27 now verse 27 we continue the story uh, let's see here uh, 27 we skip a couple of verses okay the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. Let me give you a little context. They are in prison. At night, the angel opens the door. And the angel says, go back. Go back telling everyone about this new life. And so when the, the, the religious leaders, they wake up and they go back to the temple. And they're like, okay, let's go find them. They go to the jail cell, open the door, and they're not there. And so they're not there. And someone comes running and says, they're back, out there, still teaching about Jesus, and still preaching, and still healing people. Now, this is where we pick up. The apostles were brought in, in verse 27, and made to appear before the religious court, the Sanhedrin, to be questioned by the high priest. And they say, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Yet, you have filled Jerusalem with the teaching and you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Pay attention to make us guilty. We're going to talk about that. Make us guilty. The religious leaders were saying, are you trying to make us guilty of Jesus' death? Remember this? We're going to talk about it. In verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed. There he goes again. By hanging him on the cross, and God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring to Israel repentance and forgiveness of their sins. Now, the religious leader says, they say the following, why are you trying to make us guilty of something we didn't do? Well, we read... In Matthew 26, you can go back home and read it. Verse 3, it says that the religious leaders, these guys, they were the ones who secretly conspired for the killing of Jesus. So they were guilty of Jesus' blood. But what they were doing, and here's the, here's the lesson for us, they were still trying to hide it, pretend it, blame shift it, instead of acknowledging and this is something that we all need to learn. Until we take ownership of our own mistakes, until we take ownership of the things that we do that is wrong, we're not going to be able to find forgiveness because God, when he is bringing stuff to the surface, church, when he's talking to us about something, it's not because God wants us to make us feel guilty. It's not that. If you read the end of the verse, we, it's the following. In verse 31, it says, because God wants to bring repentance and forgiveness. Yes, you are being confronted by the truth that you killed Jesus. God doesn't want to make you feel bad. But what he wants is for you to acknowledge it, and he wants to forgive you. Because it's, God is, keeps bringing this up, because he wants to you to repent because he wants to forgive you we have to understand this church because until we repent our life is going to look like a broken record you're going to come to church and it's almost like you're going to hear the same message over and over again over and over again and there's the choice when we come and we read god's word and when we come to church and we feel a little uncomfortable hey there will be times and a lot of times that we'll read the Bible and we'll come to church and the, the pastor's reading the Bible that it will make us uncomfortable. 
And it's not for us to just go like, I'm not doing this. Why are you trying to make me feel guilty of this? Why do you remind me of this, God? God is only doing this because he wants to open our eyes and he wants to forgive us. It's very important because we, we run away from discomfortable situations, uncomfortable situations. I just made up a word right there, right? Nobody likes to be uncomfortable, right? Who likes to be uncomfortable? But you come to church and you hear something like, ugh, ugh, but I'm doing that. But the Bible says don't and ugh, I don't think I'm coming back to this church. And if we do stuff like that, we're acting like the religious leaders. We're, we're like blame shifting. We're saying we're not doing it. Hey, I think I hit good enough that no one saw and no one's seeing what I'm doing. But we have to remember God sees. And when God sees, he's going to bring it to surface. Why? He wants us to repent because he wants to bless us. That's, that's God's heart. It's not for us to feel bad. Bad, bad Christian. Bad, bad Christian. You bad. You bad. You bad. We're all bad. That's a reality. Welcome to the club. I have a fun story for you to see how bad I am in a minute, okay? And so, like, we all are, but we need, we need someone that, that is the mirror of the Word of God. That as we look at the mirror, we are confronted for, by God and, or by the speaker that reads the Word of God. And that's a good thing. He's bringing to surface something that he's trying to deal in your life. Are you seeing this? So tell somebody next to you, hey, it's going to get uncomfortable sometimes. It's going to get uncomfortable sometimes. And single people, let me, tell, let me talk to you for a minute. If you're single and you still live at home, probably your mom and your dad are the ones that are going to make you uncomfortable. And they're trying to reveal to you areas in your life that you need to grow. There's a, there's a choice right there. You can say, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. We can blame shift it. No, it's because of you that I do this. You know, I used to do prison ministries. I kid you not. I, it was Donovan right here in San Diego. Everyone at Donovan is doing 25 to life. They're all lifers, it's called. Life in prison. Some with parole, some without parole. They're all doing 25 to life. You, you, I'm doing church with them in chapel. And after they come to talk to me, no one is guilty in prison. It's my mom's fault. It's my dad's fault that I'm here. It's the police officer's fault. I had only 30 grams with me, and the law said 28, and he could have given me a break until we blame shift, blame others, say that we're not. We're, what we're doing is we're throwing away the opportunity to acknowledge it and say to God, God, I'm sorry. Help me in this area. The religious leaders were still trying to say, why are you trying to make us guilty of this man's blood as if we did it? Wink, wink. They knew that they did it. And so the choice is, hey, when you start hearing the same thing over and over again, you hear it from this friend, and then you hear it from that friend, and then you hear it from that friend, you should start paying attention to that. Really, it's God revealing to you, not again, not because he wants to make you feel bad, but because he's saying, hey, there's an area that you need to work in and you need to grow in. And if you're married, hey, uh, single people, let me get you ready for marriage. And if you are married, you know what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen is you get married to the mirror. And he or she, they are the ones that are always revealing to us the areas that we need to work on. Are you following me, church? You get married to the mirror. Like my wife says, oh, yeah, the way you dis disciplined the kids was really good. And then she goes, but? I'm like, ah, the but. There's always a but. She comes in, oh, the sermon was great. And I go like, but? We have to be that. We have to listen to one another. We have to, if we close our eyes to the mirrors that God is putting in front of us, and we get married to a mirror. I tell you, mirror, husband and wife, don't mirror too much. That is every opportunity I'm going to say, hey, you could have done this wrong, you could have done that wrong, you could have done that wrong, because that's not even how God treats us. Right? Can you imagine if God every time did something like, 
It would be like receiving a little shock from God 20 times a day. Give a little break. Fight the big fights. Don't fight the little fights. The big ones, let them go. Like my wife does something that's very annoying to me. Ever since, ever since we got married, she hasn't changed. And I do something very annoying to her ever since we got married and I haven't changed. I'll tell you what it is. Pretty annoying. When she's cooking, she peels all the vegetables and instead of putting it in the trash, she puts it on the sink with the dishes. And I'm like, why? Why do you do this two-step process? Why don't you go straight into the trash can? You go and the dishes are banana pills and orange pills and potato pills and, and the cup is like, ah, ah, ah. Has she changed? No. Am I being a mirror every time? No. I'm not being that mirror. I'm like, that's a small battle. That's not worth it. The thing that I make her mad is that I make coffee. I make drip coffee. I don't like coffee makers. I think coffee made, it's not the same. I like to grind it right there, and I like to make it right there. Sometimes, I'll say nine out of ten times, I forget to get the coffee filter out of the thing and put it in the trash. And she thinks that stinks, that coffee that's been sitting there for an hour. I love coffee, but it does stink, you know? It smells a little bit like an ashtray, kind of like in your kitchen. And so she's like, she's like she looks at it. I know she goes like, but she doesn't mirror. We have to know when to mirror and not to mirror because too much mirroring gets annoying. Can you imagine somebody all the time like, oh, your, your one hair is out of, out of line. Your, your mustache is out of line. Your glass is a little, no. And so like as we come to churches, as we come to God, as we talk to our friends, as you talk to your mom and your dad and your roommates, there are going to be things that they're going to say that will make you uncomfortable. And if you want to be wise and take this to the next level and shift gears here like Formula Indy and Formula One, we start asking for feedback because sometimes they don't have the courage to tell us the things that we're doing. We have to be honest and say, hey, I need feedback in this situation. Right? Would you please help me in this situation? I did A, I did B, I did C. Would you, how, what do you think about this? No, I think you did it right. Oh, thank you. No, I think you could have done a little better. So you can always, or we can choose to be like the religious leaders. Nah, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. It's always somebody else's fault, and that's the choice we have. Now, last but not least, uh... Verse 32 now, skipping a couple of verses. Actually, we're not skipping. I'm just going. And uh, Peter says the following. We're witnesses of Christ's resurrection. We are witnesses of, of everything. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, talking about the religious leaders, they were furious, and they, want him, they wanted to put him to death. Now, if you remember in the beginning of the text, we talked about jealousy. And now, they had jealousy in their hearts. And now, at the end of the reading, they want to kill them. We need, as Christians, to be aware of our hearts and be aware of the things that, the negative, toxic, sinful things that creep in in our hearts. Because it happens weekly, church. I don't know about you. Sometimes it is jealousy. Sometimes you like, you, I had a lady at church. I was, uh, when I was a deacon, uh, my pastor assigned three people for me to uh, disciple. And I used to meet with them every, every Sunday in that, that's, that uh, room right there, the family room. This lady was on fire with God and she's loving the Christian life. One day she comes back to church and she's like, my life stinks, pastor. I'm like, I wasn't a pastor. I was a deacon. But anyways, my life stinks. I'm like, what happened? You were so on fire last week. You are so thankful to God. And now you're saying that your life stinks. What happened? Yeah, I was reading People magazine. Did you see someone's wedding? They went to Italy and they rented a castle and they spent $20 million and I'm still single. And even if I had someone, I don't think I have $2,000 to do my wedding. I'm furious starts with a little jealousy or starts with a little anger or starts with a little divisiveness in our hearts 
The point that I want you to remember is that those things, those seeds will come in our hearts because we're humans. But if we don't do anything about it, it grows. They were jealous and right now they want to kill them. And so we have to acknowledge that we're human beings. Church, I want to follow Jesus. And I want to be an imitator of Christ to the best of my ability, but I'm so far from being like Jesus. But when those situations come, with the, so here's how we deal with situations like that. Whatever it is, that it's negative, toxic, it's, it's not from God, it's sinful, that starts to grow in your heart. We have to talk to God. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us. And then we have to talk to someone, to another Christian that will be with us in the journey. The Bible says if we confess our sins to one another, you will find healing. So we talk to God. We have to acknowledge that we're not perfect. And we have to acknowledge, God, there's something starting here. You know, there's a little jealousy at my job. I know this person is getting the promotion. I'm, I'm not. And at that moment, it's the time that we talk to God. It's the time that we try to stop it in the beginning stages. The Bible says that we need to guard our hearts because from the heart, the heart is the spring well of life. Everything we say and everything we do starts in the heart. And so we have to guard it. How you guard it? Is there anything bad, negative, sinful starting to pop in my heart? I'm going to need to seek help from God. And I'm going to need to seek help from other Christians, my brothers or my sisters. Are you following me, church? And then, yes. And then we're not doing this battle thing to, alone. We're doing this battle thing together. And, and for some of you, it'll be very hard because like Pastor Nick was preaching last week, for whatever reason, we want to show the whole world that we're perfect. But we're not. Were you here last week? You got to watch that sermon. One of the best this church has ever heard. It's like, we're not. We're not perfect. So we, there's got to be a way that when those things, I don't know if it's the enemy planting those things in our hearts or if it's just our sinful nature because we're all sinners saved by grace. Right? And there's sin in us and there's Satan now. I don't know where it starts sometimes. It may start right here. It may start out there. But there's always bad things that want to grow in our hearts. And if we allow them to grow, they will become actions. Are you following me? So we need to talk to God. And talking to God, to me, I don't know about you, I think it's easier to talk to God about it. First, he's invisible. Right? And he's not going to tell anyone. Right? And he understands. But the hard part is talking to others. You don't have to be a ton of people. It can be just one person that you love and trust and you know their faith. And you know they're going to be praying for you. They're going to be encouraging you, challenging you. But we need that one person. I, my personality type, I did a personality assessment. I am the type of open book kind of person. I, I, I'm not better than anybody, but I'm open book. So this past week, I was a jerk to my daughter. And I, I ask her permission to share this story, so don't think I'm, uh, you know, uh, saying things that I shouldn't say. So I grabbed the last ice cream in the fridge. It's a, like an acai ice cream pouch, and I grab it, and I'm starting to eat. I'm, I'm like so stoked, you know. Not just because it's, I like it, but it's also because it's the last one, you know. <laughs> and, and, and let me give you a little background, a little background about her, because she's a, very similar to my wife in this one aspect. My wife and she is the same. Uh, they're the type of people that when they go to In-N-Out Burger, they don't like to share not even one fry. <laughs> my wife is like that. When I got married, I got shocked. Single people, get ready. I'm like, I thought French fries was a public domain. Anyone can touch, like, French fries. French fries is for all of us, right? That's why they're all pointing out the different directions. We're just... <laughs> gra That's what I thought. I was wrong, church. I was wrong. To get five of those, man, it's not going to happen. It's going to be pow, pow, pow. The point that I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy this thing and have five because it's better than to be slapped or have a fight with my wife. So, okay, now you know the context, you know the background. I'm not better than they are. They're not worse than I am. It's just the personality and how they handle food. Uh, anyways, I'm there, right there with my ice cream. Are you following me, the story? And she goes, can I have half of it? Ah. Of course I don't, right? But I'm like, all right, 
I can do that. All right, I'm going to do it. And so I eat half of it. And when I, I'm done with my half, I give her the half. And she goes like, do you think this is half? I can't believe you've done this to your own daughter. The one that doesn't share one french fry, remember? Oh my like, honey, you don't even share a french fry. You know, come on, give me a break. I think this was the best. Maybe I took one extra bite, maybe two from the half. I get it. But from somebody that doesn't even give me one french fry that is even pointing at me. Come on, give me a break. And she's like, no, it's like, whatever she said. I don't remember. And like a jerk, I went to her and I said, okay, give me your half. It's back my half. And I ate it. In front of her. Is that bad? Yeah, that's bad. I told you that you are in an imperfect church with imperfect leaders, and that's why you're welcome. Why am I telling you this story? I felt horrible, okay? Like you feel horrible with many situations in your life, but I'm an open book kind of guy. I came to the staff, I think that was Monday, I can't remember, we have staff meetings on Tuesday. We pray, and then right before we pray, I'm like, guys, I feel horrible today. I was a jerk to my daughter. And when you're married, learn this, I think, guys. If you hurt your daughter, you're hurting your, hurting your wife also. So I thought it was like eat, only eating half of an ice cream, but guess, no, I started a mini battle right there. <laughs> I had one person that was hurt and the other one that was sad, and I thought it was just half of an ice cream. It was much bigger than half of an ice cream. I came to the staff, because again, I'm not better than anybody, but I'm an open book kind of guy. I said, hey, you know, I was a jerk this week. I just want to confess here to you guys. Pray for me. It's not always easy. But I know that may not be easy for some of you guys. Maybe something bad, negative, that you're maybe feeling bad about. It's bothering you. You like to bottle it. You like to hide it. You like to pretend that it's not there. Put a smile, selfie, and put on Facebook and say, my life is perfect, right? But in reality, we know that we're not. So we got to find some people that we share, some people that we're open about, and some people that we can pray together. Because if we don't, that thing is still going to be there pending, in the pending file of our hearts. Are you following me, church? And so if, you, uh, if you're into TED Talks, there was a lady called Renee Brown. She had a TED Talk that went viral, I will say, a decade ago. You should watch it. Renee Brown, she's a Christian psychologist, and she did a study on happiness. And her study of happiness was the following. She's like, I'm not too sure exactly the recipe for happiness, but one thing I found in common with the happiest people that I interviewed, and she said, the people that I interviewed that were the happiest, they were okay with admitting their failures instead of hiding. They were okay with apologizing, and they were okay with moving it forward. Do you see this? It's even a study in psychology. And when God is saying, why will I confront you sometimes? Why you should be aware of things in your heart? Because I want you to be blessed. I want to bless you. I don't want your heart to have a file of pending items for me to deal with. Are you with me, church? And so that's, that's the message I had for us today. We're going to get out there. It's going to be intimidating. And let's start praying about that. Let's pray that God will change our hearts from fear to excitement. Second thing that's going to happen, it's we're going we're gonna to mess up. When we mess up, we have a, an opportunity to confess to God and be open, or are we going to hide it and pretend it like the religious leaders? That, that never happened. And then when something, ne something negative and bad starts in our heart, we have to deal with that. Guard your heart heart because from it it's the heart is the spring well of life and the bible says guard your mind guard your thoughts make sure you hold your thoughts captive and make your thoughts obedient to god don't allow your thoughts to control you you control them and you submit them to god and you submit them to somebody else and say there's some crazy stuff happening here i'm planning some crazy stuff i'm gonna slash some tires this week my co-workers being a jerk can you help me with this anger that i have right now see let's do this church that's the message that God had for us let's let's pray